going to start right in with our first presenter today, if I may. It is Mark Edwards. One of the biggest issues, most compelling issues this country is facing right now is that mobility, economic mobility, has really slowed. We have fallen behind Europe in terms of social mobility in this country, income inequality, wealth inequality. Our first presenter today, Mark Edwards, is all over this issue. He spent years involved with homeless children. And out of that experience, he began to see, as all of us have, but him maybe a little more acutely, how they were not moving up and out. The American promise is that chance to move up and out. I came to the East Coast on a little uh, truck full of hogs from the Midwest. That was the only way I had to get out here. But it was at a time when a kid like me from a little dirt farm could move up and out. I still go back, I love it. But the country has to continue to provide that kind of opportunity to folks who are not born on third base, maybe is a good metaphor today, uh, where the Sox will be running by just one after another tonight. Um, Mark Edwards uh, has moved on to be deeply involved in the launch of Opportunity Nation. He's executive director there. It's a national campaign devoted to closing the opportunity gap for Americans, making sure that a kid's zip code, a person's zip code, doesn't limit their chance for success. That is a tall challenge right now. He's organizing to help people cross that divide. Uh, as United brought together more than 250 nonprofits, businesses, education, educational institutions, and faith-based organizations, all focused on helping close that opportunity gap. They also come out with the annual Opportunity Index, and I hope he'll tell you about that. Mark Edwards says it used to be that all you needed was talent, drive, and the boldest of dreams. But now the opportunity to scale the wall seems to have ground to a halt. That cannot be in this country. He's looking to bridge that divide, close it, kickstart opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Mark Edwards. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. And um, thank you, Chancellor Motley. I want to start with a, uh, a quick story. This is the story about John and Jane. Uh, John, um, these are two young people who live here in this country. It's a story about the two of them, but it's also a story really about America and some of the challenges that we face. John lives in Dunn County, North Dakota. Jane in Skamania County, Washington State. Both live in very affluent communities. Uh, their families, let's just say their families earn about $52,000 a year, which happens to be the median income of these two counties, which actually is a greater income than the median income here in this country. So these are middle class families. Both expect to achieve the American dream, right? But let's dig a little deeper about what's going on here. So Dunn County is a prairie community located in, West, in the western part of North Dakota. It's a place with oil, hunting, and agriculture. But when we dig a little deeper, here's what we find. John's family lives in, in Dunn County. And when you look at some of the comparisons of some of the issues around Dunn compared to the national average, here's what we find. First, income inequality in Dunn County is actually relatively modest compared to the rest of the country. So John's family fits right into the social fabric. In addition to that, banks are plentiful. It's easy to get credit. You can get a loan for your mortgage. You can get interest on the money you have in your checking account. It's easy to get fresh food. There are lots of grocery stores around, so you can get fresh food on the table. When, you look at, when John looks around at the older kids on the street, nine, nearly 95% of them will graduate within four years, higher than the national average. And roughly 10% of the young adults between age 16 and 24 are no longer in school or in work. So 10% is a big number, but it's actually less than the national average. So we've got a, a community that looks like this. Let's look at Jane's community. Again, she comes from the same, the same kind of income, but the similarities seem to end there. Skamania has high levels of inequality, much more so than other parts of the country. And so as a result, Jane and her family come up against income inequality every single day. It's much harder to find a bank. So when Jane's parents want to cash their weekly paycheck, it costs them a lot of money. It's hard to get a loan. It's hard to get healthy foods. There are very few grocery stores per capita compared to lots of other places. Less than half the kids, when Jane looks down her block, less than half of them will graduate from high school in four years, much less than we saw in Dunn County. And nearly one in five of the 16 to 24 year olds in that community, less than one in five, actually uh, stay connected to education or employment. So they're no longer 
connected to the educational or employment systems. So when you compare John and Jane, do they really have equal access to the American dream? Even though they make the same amount of money, do they have equal access? Too often, the zip codes that we're born in help determine our destiny. Our core national narrative, as, John, as, as Tom talked about, this notion of social mobility, which is really at the core of how we think about ourselves as Americans, right? This is the place that no matter who you are, if you work hard and play by the rules, you should be able to do well. That's no longer working if you come from the wrong zip code. You look at the zip codes that we're sitting in right now. Why are we surprised that a, that a young, young kid who lives in 02119 doesn't have, the same, doesn't have the same chances in life as the kid who comes from 02445. So what does that mean for the American dream? Child poverty, youth unemployment, income inequality are all at an all-time high. For the first time, the prospects of young people in this country are actually less than their parents. So the core of the American dream, this idea of social mobility, is stuck. Many European countries, as Tom mentioned, actually have more mobility than we do here. If you're born poor, your chances of doing better, if you're born in one of these countries, is actually better now than it is here in America. Today, only 4% of those who are born in the, four, in the lowest quintile actually make their way to the top. Very different than what it was 50 years ago. And of the bottom two quintiles, 70% of the people who were born there remain there. So there's a lot of stickiness now in the income spectrum. Those at the top, tend to stay there, those at the bottom tend to stay there. And so in this country, we've had a remarkable uh, willingness to, in to tolerate income inequality, right? I mean, people sort of say it's a problem, but at the same time, if there's this core notion that no matter if I work hard, I can actually get there myself. When that ends, when that ends, what happens to this notion of the American dream? So what have we done about this? What is a country of what's been our response to this issue? We have, at this point, roughly 1.5 million nonprofits, each of which is doing their own thing. They're all working in their silos. The various sectors that are important, government, education, business, the civic sectors, faith communities, we're not collaborating, we're not cooperating. Very little collaboration. And each of these sectors has their own success stories that are important, and we have to hold these up, these incredible success stories of individual achievement. But the hard truth is that the tidal wave is moving in the other direction. We want singular solutions. It's just about jobs, right? But if you're a single mom who has a young child, who lives in a community that does not have high quality early education, doesn't have access to primary health care, may not have access to the internet, can't put healthy food in the food table, you live around violent crime, maybe a job is not enough. But yeah, that's what we really focus on, right? It's really all about jobs. We know it's more about that. So the American dream needs a jump start. But the truth is, there are no silver bullets. There's not one thing that's going to solve this problem. And so if we think back on Jane and Skamania, what are we going to do? Two years ago, I launched Opportunity Nation, which was a national campaign to increase economic opportunity and close the opportunity gap. We launched with a national summit in New York City. Time Magazine did a cover story on economic mobility that featured some of our work. And what we've tried to do over this period of time is bring together a whole set of coalition members who are working together to change this issue. A lot of the large national nonprofits, United Way Worldwide, Habitat for Humanity, Teach for America, we brought together some of the major think tanks on the left, right, and center, the Center for American Progress, Brookings, the Heritage Foundation. We're not a direct service organization. Our goal is to knit together the opportunity movement. We spent a year listening to, to, to low-income people all around the country to find out what they felt were the biggest barriers to opportunity. And this is what they told us. First, they said, stop talking exclusively about poverty. It's not a term that we use to describe ourselves. Poverty, unfortunately, is about us versus them. It's about those people. This is an issue that all of us have to work together because it affects all of us. They also said that opportunity is not just about a job. Opportunity is about the communities that you live in. Do people volunteer and work together? Do you have access to health care? Are there schools? Can you get access to early childhood education? Is there affordable housing? Do I have basic access to the internet? How can you be a community of opportunity if you don't have access to the internet? Can I put healthy foods on the table? And so as, a, as an organization that was pro-opportunity, we said, how are we going to make sense of this? We as a country don't think about measuring opportunity. We measure jobs, we measure poverty, but we don't measure opportunity. 
And so two years ago, we brought together, we brought all this together and, and created really what, what one author has called the first statistical measure of the American dream, called the Opportunity Index. And I encourage you to take out your smartphones right now and go to opportunityindex.org. You can take a look at what, uh, what we're doing here. It's an open source website. We developed this with Measure of America. And it's really a desire to try to take the complex set of factors that create opportunity and, and give communities and states opportunity scores. We rank all 50 states. And then we take the 3,000 counties that touch about 99% of Americans and put them into grades A through F. And so for the first time, you can now get an opportunity score that goes beyond just simply GDP, that goes beyond just simply jobs. What we've done is take about 16 indicators that come together. And some of them are pretty obvious. Obviously, the local economy is important, uh, the local jobs, local unemployment rate. We look at whether you have access to high school education, but we also look at a set of factors which we know are really critical, which have to do with the whole notion of social capital. We know that when communities have high social capital, when people work together, when they're connected institutions, when they're part of organizations, those communities tend to do well. And so at opportunitynix.org right now, you can actually look at three different years' worth of data and begin to look at trends about what's going on. So let me take you a little bit into what's going on here. And the core of this idea is that in this country, though, we've talked for so long about the idea that, uh, that success is really about what I do as an individual, right? If I work hard. What we really know is that all of us grow up in communities. And those communities can either be pro-opportunity or not. And we need to start focusing on this and measuring this, because this is really going to be the core of how we can begin to move forward. So this is what opportunityindex.org looks like, sort of the main, the main home page. Uh, you can compare states. You can look at three different years' worth of data. What I would love to do is go back 30 years, right, and look at what's happened to opportunity scores, look at how policymakers have changed that. We're not quite there yet, but we're working on that. And you can plug in states. So I thought what we'd do is plug in Massachusetts here. This is a place to start. So Massachusetts actually ranks number seven. We're seven out of 51, the 50 states plus Washington, D.C. And uh, Massachusetts does very well overall. Um, but what you also see, and what's much more interesting, is when you start looking at the county data. Because all of us know, of course, that states are amalgams of lots of different communities. And so when you break down to the counties, you begin to see some very interesting differences. So right here in, in Suffolk County, again, you can just plug Suffolk County right into the uh, search bar, and it'll come up with an opportunity score. Suffolk County gets a C plus. So on the one hand, we have relatively high uh, median income compared to the national average. But we also have high rates of poverty high rates of inequality, a remarkably small number of our, of our high school students end up graduating in four years. We have a relatively high violent crime rate, so we end up with a C plus. However, in Massachusetts, looking at Dukes County, you get an A. This is a place where you have very, 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 very high access to health care, a remarkably high percentage of four-year-olds are in preschool. It's a place where it's very easy to get banked, lots of banking, and so on. So when we looked at the Opportunity Index and did some analysis last year, we tried to get a sense of what were the factors that really drove opportunity scores. And as we have these 16 different indicators, but what are the things that really drive scores? And what we found, more than anything, more than even uh, available jobs, more than even the poverty rate, that what drives community scores, the thing that's most correlated, is actually the percentage of what we call disconnected youth, which are young adults who are neither in school nor in work. When communities do well, this population is doing well. When communities don't do well, this population is not doing well. And what's going on here? So a number of things. One is that, uh, first of all, the numbers are staggering. Um, nearly one in seven young adults in this country today are neither in school nor in work. What we know is that when young adults are not connected, their chances of doing well are quite poor. We know that in that critical window, if they get off the employment or the education track, their lifetime earnings are going to be literally a million dollars less. Their contribution to society will be less. Um, and so this is a critical piece of the opportunity equation. And as a, as a country, our view is that as part of the opportunity spectrum, we have got to focus on this. We've got to get young adults reconnected. We've got to also make sure they don't get off the opportunity, um, the opportunity spectrum. And so when we look at this, we see a couple things. One is, um, uh, I guess I said, one in, one in seven of these adults are now, um, young adults are actually not connected. At the same time, in this country, we've got 3 million unfilled jobs. Right In the middle of the recession, you have 3 million unfilled jobs. You've got a big group of people who are eager to be connected. Having done a lot of research with this group, having talked to them, having done surveys, what we find are a couple of things. One is that they are eager to be a part of the workforce. This is a group, th the truth is that we can no longer think about success in this country exclusively as a four-year four -year college, four years of high school, four years of college, and then you get a job. 
Many young adults have to work. They, can't, they have to take care of their families. They can't simply go through that sort of eight years of education on their own. And so we've got to find multiple ways to make sure we meet them where we are. There's a lot of innovative programs in the country where you find now some of these earn and learn programs where people can actually go to school, they can work at the same time, a lot of innovation, it's working. What, what companies are finding when they, talk, when they work with this population is that they're remarkably loyal, they're eager for a chance to get back on the track, and we view that this is one of the critical pieces of getting our economy back on track again. Many of these three million jobs that are available today are jobs that actually require not a four-year Bachelor of Arts degree, but actually a one or two year technical education with some very specific skills, which are really gateways to the middle class. And so we've got to elevate those that's really being important pathways. We cannot think of success exclusively as a four-year Bachelor of Arts degree. We've got to have many more pathways to success. And so part of our job at Opportunity Nation is to bring together this broad coalition of organizations that's working on doing just that. We're seeing it in the private sector. Or, uh, states like the state of Iowa have really had some really innovative partnerships between some of the major advanced manufacturing organizations, community colleges, four-year colleges, nonprofits, really finding strong pathways for young adults to help facilitate that. We've seen this across the country in lots of different ways. And so the important thing is to really try to elevate these multiple, multiple pathways. And so when we go back to John and Jane, here's what we found out. So John, who lives in Dunn County, John gets a B. The chances of John doing well are actually quite high. Jane, however, in Skamania County, gets a D plus. Same money, same income, but their shot at the American dream is going to be much less. So our hope as a, as a, as a campaign and really speaking with all of you is that we can get out of our silos, that we can really begin to focus on collaboration as an important tool to making sure we can move forward. Let's get beyond measuring GDP and unemployment as the metrics of how we're doing as a country. Those values, as important as they are, are not going to be the core of how we ought to think about the work we're doing. Our hope for the Opportunity Index is that 30 years from now, elections will rise and fall based on opportunity scores. This is what we want people focusing on. And as a community, as a state, as a country, we feel we can come together for that. Thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mark Edwards. That's just great. I'm so glad you're focused on it and focused on it in this holistic way. Um, got a response from the audience already. People are tweeting and thank you for that. Sarah says, it's a beautiful morning to inspire a new commitment to the American dream. Amen to that, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got more in the tweets as well. I've got questions for you. First, the Globe had a piece recently saying that some of the inequality right here in our community is driven because we have developed beautifully, wonderfully, this high-tech, high-learning economy, which is fantastic, but, you know, if you're not writing high at MIT or at Harvard or at UMass Boston, you are not in the game. What about the particular challenges of the very kind of thread of success we've had here in Boston? Well, I think the truth about some of these jobs that are available today is that it's not simply for the PhDs. A lot of those jobs are actually in the technical space, really require some of the special training that you can get often at community college or some of these technical schools. I think our view is that we have to celebrate those pathways to success because there actually are jobs that are available today in those fields that are available right now for people who have some of these one and two year degrees. But what about the income gap? You may get that job, but that doesn't mean you, we may still have these, this vast canyon between those folks. Good, they've got a job, but... One of the great stories about this sort of collaboration that we've seen happening, particularly in places like Iowa, is they're bringing together uh, some of the employers, the educational institutions, and the nonprofits who are working on some of the soft skills that help make sure that these young adults are not getting trained for a specific job, but are actually getting trained for a career. So it's not just simply about putting the blinders on and saying, let's make sure I know how to work this piece of equipment. They're developing a lot of the skills around that so they'll actually have a foundation for a full career. So we've seen some real progress there. You're working with a lot of organizations to try and address this, faith-based and educational. Who do you find is organizational, institutionally? Who's open to this? Who's on fire about this? And who's not? Who's like, hey, I'm fine, Jack, back off? Well, I think one of the uh, things that we've learned over the last couple of years is that the framing around this is really important. The framing of opportunity brings more voices into the table. We couldn't have not gotten the Heritage Foundation, the Center for American Progress, and Brookings, three organizations that don't spend a whole lot of time together, in the room if we said, let's get together to talk about poverty. But the opportunity frame brings businesses in, it brings educational institutions, so we've got a lot of yeses there. I think the folks that are, that if we run into any challenges, it's some of the, candidly, some of the entrenched interests that are benefiting from the system the way it is now. We're interested in innovation, we're interested in partnership, we're interested in breaking down the silos, and some, some of those organizations that are sort of working in those 
court, those court silos that are getting funding, those are some of the ones that we're running up against. Name names, like who, like what, what kind of, ins <laughs> who's, who's the entrenched institution that's saying, yeah, we love this inequality? Well, I'm not going to name any names well, today, but, Tom, but um, <laughs> I mean, help, help us understand the, the yeah, geography yeah, here. Yeah. Like, well, when you look at organizations, there, there are a set of organizations that are getting federal funding right now that are actually benefiting from the current funding stream, but often funds inputs, not outputs. We're interested in results. So you're and talking so, social welfare institutions. That's part of the mix. That's part of the mix. And so we're trying to mix it up and say, let's bring partnerships together. Let's start to fund some of these collaboratives that we know are making a difference. Let's get out of the silos of saying, all I'm going to focus on is this particular part of the spectrum, because we know that alone is not going to Now, that's, that's counterintuitive, and that's interesting. Um, here, uh, one of our listeners, or one of our audience says, uh, tweets to us, why is it so surprising that social mobility here has dropped behind Europe? We've continued to distance ourselves from the poor. With this, you're saying, even some of the institutions designed to help the poor, we have to be careful. They can develop a perverse interest in having a lot of poor to help. I, I think there's some of that. And I think there's an increasing realization that uh, individual sectors on their own are not going to solve this problem. I, I have to say, I, you know, I look at the, well, here, here's the question. I look at the bigger picture. I mean, you're talking about zip code as destiny. That can't be in this country. 70% born low, 70% stay low. Yep. That, that is a terrible formula for us. And this fragmented, inadequate response to a tidal wave, your words, of inequality. Does our infamous uh, money-dominated politics, big money politics, block systemic change somehow? Does it short circuit? You would think that the natural response of a healthy democracy would be to look at a, a really inequitable distribution and say, hey, we're all for opportunity, we're all for success, we're all for the rich, but this is getting a little wacky. Is there a problem in big money politics blocking systemic change? I think there is, Tom, but I also think that uh, in many ways, this idea is really at the core of how we think about ourselves as a country. So my hope, and I'm actually optimistic, is that if we focus on this notion of opportunity and what that actually means, we may have some disagreements about exactly how to get there, but if we can start with that framing, which is really common ground, it's really at the core of who we are as a country, that we're going to begin to see some progress. And candidly, at the federal government, we're actually seeing some progress. We found some bipartisan ideas that even in this environment are actually beginning to make some progress. So I, I'm actually optimistic that if we're focusing on the right kinds of things, we'll actually see some progress. We will take your optimism, but keep a very uh, skeptical eye cocked as we watch these numbers. Mark Edwards, we're so grateful for your work and your wonderful presentation right. today. Thank you very much. You, Mark Edwards, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Social mobility in America and Mark Edwards right in there working on it like crazy.